there's no place like family. It is uh, Taylor and I was privileged to be a part of this family. How many know community is everything? Yeah. Community is everything. I would rather have cheese and crackers with a kind person uh, than steak and lobster with a jerk. Amen. <laughs> community is absolutely everything, and we're honored to be a part uh, of this community. And, um, and I'm excited to preach God's word today. Are you ready to hear it? Yeah. Come on, if you feel like hearing it, like I feel like preaching, and I feel like God's going to do something in this place today. It's going to be good. And I want to take a moment as well, because we are a house of honor, to thank God on this Father's Day for the father of this house. Uh, Pastor Hennessy has a book coming out, and uh, he gave me the privilege of writing the foreword for the book. And in the foreword, I said, if I could define Pastor Hennessy in one word, it would be consistency. So many different words I could say, but consistency. I've watched over the years. I've been here since I was three. How faithful and consistent he's been. And we live in a culture where everybody quits. It's normal to quit, but I just am thankful for a leader that is just stupid enough to stick with it. And it's amazing to see what God has done because of your faithfulness. Can we thank God for Pastor Hennessy, for the father of this house? Come on, church, you could do better than that. If you online watching in your bathrobe, come on. We honor you. We thank God for you. I love you. I appreciate you. Amen. And again, thank you to all the mighty men in the house today. Would you stand with me to honor the reading of God's word? We're going to be in the book of Acts today, Acts 26. And because I have the microphone, I can also honor my father, Robert Meduse Sr., the one who I get the privilege of doing his voice any time that I can. And I thank God for my Nigerian father. And uh, I think at 13, I was taller than him. But uh, no matter how tall I get, I still look up to you, Dad, and uh, I'm thankful for who you are. You are the greatest man of God that I know, so help me thank God for my dad. Okay, Acts 26, we're going to start at verse number one and go down to verse 25. I hope you brought your good shoes uh, today, and I, I'll try to edit it, but I need all of it for you to get where we're going and uh, I'll read fast. Plus, it was my birthday yesterday, so it's my prerogative. Plus, it's Father's Day. Uh, but when you're ready to read it, say, yeah. yeah. If you need some time to find Acts 26, say, hold up. All right, it's on the screen. Come on, so watch what it says. It says, then, then Agrippa, this is the Apostle Paul on trial. And then King Agrippa said to Paul, you may speak in your defense. So Paul, gesturing with his hand, started his defense. I am fortunate, King Agrippa, that you are the one hearing my defense today against all these accusations made by the Jewish leaders. For I know you are an expert on all Jewish customs and controversies. Now please listen to me patiently. As the Jewish leaders are all aware, well aware, I was given a thorough Jewish training from my earliest childhood among my own people in Jerusalem. And if they would admit it, they know that I have been a member of the Pharisees, the strictest sect of our religion. Now I'm on trial because of my hope in the fulfillment of God's promise made to our ancestors. In fact, that is why the 12 tribes of Israel zealously worship God night and day, and they share the same hope I have. Yet, your majesty, they accuse me for having this hope. Why does it seem incredible to any of you that God can raise the dead? I used to believe that I ought to do everything I could to oppose the very name of Jesus the Nazarene. Indeed, I did just that in Jerusalem, authorized by the leading priest. I caused many believers there to be sent to prison, and I cast my vote against them when they were condemned to death. Many times I had them punished in the synagogues to get them to curse Jesus. I was so violently opposed to them that I even chased them down in foreign cities. But one day... How many are thankful that with God, you can have a one day? Come on, you all never give up. Don't commit suicide. One day can change the trajectory of your life. One day, I was on such a mission to Damascus, armed with the authority and commission of the leading priest. About noon, your majesty, as I was on the road, a light from heaven, brighter than the sun, shone down on me and my companions. We all fell down and heard a voice saying to me in Aramaic, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is useless for you to fight against my will. Who are you, 
Lord, I asked, and the Lord replied, I am Jesus, the one you are persecuting. Now get to your feet, for I have appeared to you to appoint you as my servant and witness. Tell people that you have seen me and tell them what I will show you in the future, and I will rescue you from both your own people and the Gentiles. Yes, I am sending you to the Gentiles to open their eyes so they may turn from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to God. God, then they will receive forgiveness for their sins and be given a place among God's people who are set apart by faith in me. And so, King Agrippa, I obeyed that vision from heaven. I preached first to those in Damascus, then in Jerusalem, and all throughout Judea, and also to the Gentiles that all, all must repent of their sins and turn to God and prove they have changed by the good things they do. Some Jews arrested me in the temple for preaching this, and they tried to kill me, but... God has protected me right up to this present time so I can testify to everyone from the least to the greatest. I teach nothing except what the prophets and Moses said would happen, that the Messiah would suffer and be the first to rise from the dead and in this way announce God's light to Jews and Gentiles alike. Suddenly Festus shouted, Paul, you're insane. Too much study has made you cray cray. Paul replied, I am not insane, most excellent Festus. What I am saying is the sober truth. <laughs> Whew, that's good. I mean, let's go home. Happy Father's Day. That's good all by itself. Oh, I love it. I love it. I love it. I love it. Now, I, usually at this moment, I would give you my title, but since it is Father's Day, I'm going to allow a few good men to give you my title. So let's pray. Father, you're amazing. Speak today. Amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. If Lieutenant Kendrick gave an order that Santiago wasn't to be touched, then why did he have to be transferred? Colonel, Lieutenant Kendrick ordered the code red, didn't he? Because that's what you told Lieutenant Kendrick to do. Object! And when it went bad, you cut cases. these guys loose! Your Honor! You had more inside the bony transport! Your, your Honor! You doctored the logbook! Damn it, Captain! You coerced the doctor! Consider Not yourself in contempt! Here. Colonel Jessup! Did you order the code red? You don't have to answer that question. I'll answer the question. You want answers? I think I'm entitled to You them. want answers! I want the truth! You can't handle the truth! Thank you, Jack Nicholson. That's my title today. I want to talk to you for about six hours from the thought, you can't handle the truth. Hmm. Has anybody in here ever been through a trial? Come on, can I see your hand? Have you ever been through a trial? Come on. I'm talking about a long trial. Come on, I'm talking about a trial that made you pray. I'm talking about a trial in court. Okay, everybody's hand just went down. <laughs> I love church people. I love us because there are certain words that when said, we cognitively connect to something else. Okay, as soon as I say trial, you went opposition. Church people do this all the time. True story. A friend of mine even posted a couple of days ago. He posted on Instagram, does anybody have power? And some church people responded and said, yep, Holy Ghost power. <laughs> He's like, no, like my power went out. I, the, the storm, does anybody have power? <laughs> So when I said trial, when I said trial, you immediately went to opposition. Ooh, it took my Toyota 10 minutes to start today. Yes, I, I'm going through a trial. No, I'm talking about a trial. I'm talking about a Matlock, Perry Mason, Judge Judy, Johnny Cochran, OJ trial where you are on the witness stand. A judge is to your right. There's a jury to your left. And Tom Cruise is in front of you saying, I want answers. I want the truth. Anybody been through that trial? Okay, a few of you. Okay, I have not. I have not, nor do I plan to. I do not plan to be on the witness stand because I don't think I could handle the pressure of being prosecuted. Oh, how many of you know just the pressure of being prosecuted and asked intense questions, whether you're guilty or innocent, sometimes just the pressure of being prosecuted and ask tough questions can make you sweat. No, don't put me on the witness stand. I don't know if I can handle the pressure of the questions being put on trial. It is pressure when you're being questioned. Come on, it's Father's Day. Fathers, be honest, be honest, all the married men. Have you ever circled around your driveway 
a couple of times before you pulled in because you knew, you knew that when you walked in the house that your living room was going to turn into a courtroom. And you married to the prosecuting attorney. And she got some questions for you as soon as you walk. Ah, excuse me, uh, the court and your kids would like to know why you thought it was okay to go to Orange Theory Fitness for an hour while I'm by myself with all three kids. No, nah, you be healthy. I'll parent the kids. No further questions, Your Honor. The, the questions, sometimes just to be questioned, <laughs> can elicit a feeling of guilt even when you're innocent. And how many of you know, I don't need a scientist to prove this, you just need a Netflix account. And you can see documentaries and true stories of people who were innocent, but when they were pressured with questions, said they were guilty of crimes they never even did. Why does humanity feel guilty? I think it goes back to the first trial. Come on, you remember the first trial in the book of Genesis, that historic case that jacked up humanity for all eternity? Come on, courtroom, Garden of Eden, defendant Adam, co-defendant Eve. And what was the charge? Do you remember their charge? What was the charge? Eating, eating fruit. Was that the charge? For real? That's what messed up all of humanity, that they ate fruit. That's what sent humanity into depravity. If that is the case, shut down every fruit section and whole foods and sprouts. Come on, it's deeper than the fruit. The fruit was just the fruit. It's even deeper than their disobedience. Because if we reduce the fall of man to simply disobedience, then we reduce our God to some preeminent, omnipotent parole officer who was just standing over us and created humanity so that we could fall in line and do what he tells us to do. And I'm G-O-D with the capital G. I said, don't trust the tree, so do what I tell you. We can't reduce God to disobedience. It was deeper than that because how many of you know with every commandment God gives you, his commandments are intrinsically and cohesively connected to his character. God's commandments are connected to his character. You cannot separate God's commandment from his character in the same way you cannot separate wet from water. They are connected. He says don't lie because he's the truth. He says don't murder because he is the life. His commandments are connected to his character. And the enemy was subtle enough to know this, so he attacks God's character. And when he attacked God's character, he knew if I can get you to doubt his character you're gonna break his commandment so before the fruit was ever in their mouth there was a lie in their mind and here was the lie that God is not good and he is keeping good from you and once that lie got in their mind sin entered the world and all of humanity got on the trajectory of a trial and we had to be questioned Ooh, you remember the questions where are you they're butt naked in the courtroom, hiding behind the fig leaves. <laughs> Who told you you were naked? God had quite, did you eat of the tree that I told you not to? Sin put humanity on trial. You don't believe me? Even their kids ended up in the courtroom. Oh yes, Cain committed the first, first degree murder. And here is Cain being questioned by God. And here's the question, where is your brother Abel, where is he questioned? Why does God ask humanity questions? Not to get information, not even to get the truth. How many know when God asks you a question, he's not trying to get truth from you. He's trying to show you that truth is in front of you because he is the way, the truth, and the life. Come on, God will only ask you a question that he's saying, I'm the one that can answer it because truth is right in front front of you. He is truth personified. The only problem with us is we can't handle the truth. You can't handle, I can't handle the truth so it's easier to live with the lie. Have you ever lived with the lie because you couldn't handle the truth? As a matter of fact, you can tell yourself a lie long enough that it becomes your truth. In fact, I think the, the only thing scarier than a lie is a lie that has become your truth. 
And this is the culture and society in which we live because everybody's screaming, this is my truth. Truth is subjective. I got my truth. You got your truth. There's no right. There's no wrong. You got a truth. I got a truth. You pick your truth. I pick my truth, okay? Don't ask about my truth. Worry about your truth because my truth is different from your truth, okay? Your truth is that there's gravity. That's not my truth. I believe I can fly. Excuse me. <laughs> Jump off a bridge, but how many of you know there's some stuff that is just truth, and truth has the power to transform you. Truth can change you, but don't clap too soon. It will tick you off before it transforms you. So if Jesus is truth personified, if you have an encounter with Jesus, how many of you know you won't just be moved? You might get mad because people do not like the truth. And yet we serve a God who says, I am just like yoga pants, toddlers, and drunk people, meaning I always are going to give you the truth. <laughs> Some of you will get that joke tomorrow, but it's funny. He says, I got to give you the truth. Somebody just got it. And the Apostle Paul in our text today is on trial. Paul is on trial. And Paul, watch this, in our text, has been in prison for two years under the governor, Felix. He's been in prison for two years in Caesarea. In fact, I leave for Jerusalem tomorrow. I will be there. And Paul's on trial. He's been in prison, wrongly accused for two years. A new governor comes into place, Festus. And Festus is going to send Paul back to Jerusalem so the Jews can kill him on the way. Paul is a citizen of Rome, so he appeals to Caesar and says, oh, no, you're not sending me back to Jerusalem to kill me. I appeal to Caesar. So all of a sudden, watch this. At the moment Paul appeals to Caesar, King Agrippa, Herod Agrippa, comes into town. And he comes into town like Aladdin after he met the genie. Okay, it was a huge brigade that came in. King Agrippa is the great grandson of Herod the Great. You remember the Herod that thought by killing the young babies that he could destroy Jesus. But how many know you can't handle the truth? You can push truth down. It's going to come right back around. And King Agrippa comes into town and is having a meeting with Festus. And Festus says, I got this problem with Paul. They can't find any charge that'll stick. And they want me to send him back to Jerusalem so they can kill him. He said, but they don't have any legit charge, and I can't send him to Caesar without a real charge. What should I do? And King Agrippa goes, I want to hear about this Paul. He said, well, great. His trial is tomorrow. And you got to see this because this is a major motion picture. So Paul walks into the courtroom, chains on his hands. And as he walks into the courtroom, King Agrippa is there. Festus is there. Every prominent leader, every sage of the age, every world leader, every powerful political person is in that room when Paul walks in and he looks around the room and he sees King Agrippa and he sees Festus and he sees Oprah and he sees Warren Buffett and he sees Mark Zuckerberg and he sees the Kardashians and he sees LeBron and as he's walking around the room he goes oh Boy, this is my trial, but this trial is not for me. This trial ain't even a trial. This trial whoo, is a trap. God, I see what you're doing. You about to get them the same way you got me on the road to Damascus. And they about to give me the microphone? Oh, I'm about to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. All of a sudden, he realizes this is my trial, but this trial has nothing to do with me. God set this trial up so this audience around me can see the power of what Jesus can do when he comes in your life. Come on, I don't know who I'm preaching to, but your trial is not about you. People are watching you. They're trying to see if you're going to praise God in spite of the cancer in your body. They're trying to see, are you going to trust them even when you don't have the money? Paul says, oh, all I need is one mic. I'm about to testify and give my cardboard testimony right now. He 
says, I'm going to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. And God set up disappointment for Paul to tell his story. Never underestimate the power of your story and where God has brought you from. Never underestimate the power of your BC life. See, don't come into church and act like you're in the witness protection program and try to dress up your story and act like you've been saved your whole life. Come on, there's actually a generation that needs to know you used to be in the club too. So you can tell them, no, 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 it ain't even worth it. Trust me, I tried some of them. But God changed my life. He just tells his story for 25 verses. He's innocent but never defends himself. He just tells a story of how God changed his life. And he does it in three parts. And let me give them to you very quickly because we're going to get some barbecue today for Father's Day. <laughs> the first thing Paul reveals in his testimony, in his story, is something that made me go to Target at 9.15 last night. Paul first talks about... talks about the cover. If you're a note taker, I want to talk about the cover. Talk about the cover. It's so funny. Alec, I'm going to call him out. He, he helped me with the sermon because I told him I was going to open up this umbrella for an illustration. He goes, you going to open up an umbrella inside the sanctuary? And I'm so glad I said, oh, you set up my sermon. You set up my sermon too good. Thank you for saying that. Because here's what the cover is. The cover is the truth that you stand under. The cover is a truth that you stand under. How many of you know, I love an umbrella because the only way an umbrella works is if you stand under. It only works if you stand so you under. The cover is the truth that you stand under, and all of us have truths that we stand under. He said, you're going to open an umbrella inside because there is a cultural truth that that's bad luck, but that is not the truth that I stand under. I don't stand under the truth of luck. I'm already blessed. I stand under the truth that no matter what happens to me, God is sovereign. I stand under the truth that all things work for the good of them that love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. No matter what comes in my life, good or bad, God still has his hand on me. I might not like it, but I'm going to get through it. It's, that's not the truth I stand under. So, hello, I go Mary Poppins. I don't care. I'll do this. All. What's the truth? What's the truth you stand under? The truth you stand under is critical because the truth you stand under governs your decisions. The truth you stand under shapes your understanding. My scope of perspective is connected to the circumference of this umbrella. This is what I see. This is my truth. And Paul begins his testimony saying, for most of my life, I was standing under a truth that was a lie. From the time I was born, I interned at the synagogue. I thought Judaism was the way and I thought I was under the right truth to the point I was willing to kill people for my truth. But all of a sudden I realized the truth I was standing under was a lie. I wonder if the truth you're standing under is a lie. And sometimes you don't even know it's a lie until God shines a light and shows you that the whole time I've been standing under a truth that was a lie. I feel like preaching this in here today because this is deeper than faith. This is deeper than spirituality. This connects to your relationships. The truth you stand under in relationships, the truth you stand under about people will affect your relationship. If the truth you stand under, all men are dogs. All of them. That's the truth you stand under. Well, no wonder you can't find a good man. Because <laughs> that's the truth that you stand under. You're looking for Bow Wow because that's the truth. 
that you stand under. People do this about people groups and the truth that they stand under. And until you have the humility to see the real truth, not a truth, but the truth, you'll be blinded by a truth. I'm going to stay right here. People will do this in relationships and how they talk about other people, how they talk about other people. Chris, will you help me real quick? Come here. Chris, will you help me? Yeah, come up here. They'll do this when, you talk, when they talk about people. Watch this. Have you ever seen this? Where somebody told you something about somebody else under their truth about that person? So I, here's how it works. You call, I call Chris under here. I was like, huh, let me tell you about Larry, Chris, right there on the front. Now stay under here. It's just you and I. Now I normally wouldn't say this to people, but I'm going to say this to you because I trust you. So maybe you can pray for him. But Larry, oh, you cannot trust him. He's a backstabber. He talks about, now stay under here. He talks about people. I'm telling you, you cannot trust him, Chris. Now you just do what you want with that. Pray about it. I'm just telling you. That's how he is. But I told him that under my truth. But all of a sudden, if he gets out from under my truth and actually has a conversation with Larry and meets Larry, he finds out, wait a minute, Larry's the kindest person I've ever met. My Toyota broke down and Larry picked me up. That's not true. Of course it wasn't true. It was my truth. I'm just wondering... Are you standing under a truth that's actually a lie? And you're proud of your truth. This is my truth. Singing it loud. You know, just because you sing loud doesn't mean you got the right lyrics. <laughs> I didn't give this the first service. I'm going to give it to you. Just because you're loud don't mean you got the right lyrics. Some of y'all super saved. You only know Amazing Grace. But... You know that Mariah Carey song? Uh, Cause you'll always be my baby and we'll linger on. Time cataracts, the feeling is strong. <laughs> you know the song? And we linger on. Time cataracts, the feeling is strong. <laughs> I sang that song for years. Thinking Mariah was talking about time cataracts. Until one of those friends who you have, Accurate Alley, who got a fact for everything. I oh, know, actually. Actually, it's time can erase a feeling this strong. I said, you a liar and the devil is a lie. She goes, look up the lyrics. And I looked it up. That's true. I've been singing Tom. What is Tom Cataracts? I don't know if Mariah had eye issues, but that's what I thought she was saying. And I'm singing a lot, time cataracts, the feeling is strong. <laughs> Loud. Wrong lyrics. Just wondering if the truth you stand under is a lie. I had to bring this umbrella too because, you know, Taylor and I, we have a marriage problem and a huge, and I found out on our honeymoon, somebody like, is he for real or <laughs> not for real? That on our honeymoon, we have a huge marriage problem, and it happens every summer. Because when we go uh, to the beach or the pool, uh, we have a huge problem, marriage problem, that is unique to our marriage. And because when we go to the pool um, or the beach, I'm going uh, to chill. That's why I'm there. She's going to be changed. <laughs> I am content with the tone, very content and the melanin with which I have. <laughs> she is going <laughs> to get darker. So we have a challenge, especially when they're at a bougie hotel. And they, they want to set up a place at the pool and they go, do y'all want an area with sun or shade? And we look at each other and go, both. Because <laughs> she wants the sun, I want the shade. Shade does not exist. Shade is just shelter. So anytime you see me and tell her at the pool, this happened yesterday, we were in Miami. Anytime you see us at the pool, you will see three chairs. You'll see one chair in the sun for Taylor, one in the middle for space, and then my chair, and next to my chair, <laughs> is the umbrella. Because I need the umbrella to block the sun. But how many know, even though my umbrella is blocking the sun, 
It is not denying the reality of the sun. Although I'm in the shade sipping on lemonade, I better not get too comfortable because just because I'm blocking the sun doesn't mean I'm denying the reality of the sun. And so many of us think that we have our own truth and this is who I am. And you think you're blocking a God who is the sun, S-O-N, of the living God? How many of you know your truth might try to block it? but it doesn't deny the reality of the sun. And God wants to remove the cover so that you can be changed. Paul said, all my life I had the cover, and it wasn't until I saw a bright light that I realized I had a cover. I had a truth, but I'm seeing the truth. And I love it because when you saw the bright light, it blinded him. Only God will use light to blind you. We cut on light to see. God says, I'm going to cut on light to blind you. And Paul is blind, and yet for the first time he can see. He's no longer holding the opinion of what he thought. And now he's relying on the very ones he was killing. And he couldn't see. Theologians have many debates as to what Damascus actually means. But I think... Maybe the reason he was on the road to Damascus, because that's what God has always been trying to do. He's been trying to demask us. He's been trying to get us to get rid of the cover so we can see him. He wants to demask us. I feel his presence. Somebody, today is your day to get demasked so you can see the truth, not a truth. Because if you get demasked, if you remove the cover, you get to the second step that Paul tells in his testimony. You go from the cover to the conversion. To the conversion. Quick question, and I'm landing the plane. When was Paul converted? When was Paul converted? How does conversion take place? When was the moment that Paul was converted? Some of you would say, well, brother, it's quite easy. I mean, look at the Bible. You know when he was converted on that road to Damascus. He was killing Christians. He was a persecutor. And then he became a powerful preacher of the gospel. In that, he saw the light. And when he saw the light, at that moment, he was converted. Maybe. But to reduce Paul's conversion to the Damascus road would be to reduce having a baby to just the delivery room. How many know the magnitude of the moment in the delivery room is preceded by a process that is just as powerful? Okay. Understand, when we found out we were having a baby, Taylor was so early that they did a blood test to find out we were pregnant. And as soon as we found out, as soon as we found out we were pregnant, I immediately got in my car and drove to the Nike store. Just found out, went to the Nike store, and I said, I need the smallest pair of Air Jordans <laughs> that y'all carry. <laughs> Didn't even know what we were having. And they go, uh, how old is your baby? I go, one day. <laughs> he said, and you're here? I said, no, not like born, like we just found out today. <laughs> it was a pro, we're nesting, we're creating, all of that led up, and then finally, there was the magnitude of the moment in the delivery room. Paul's Damascus moment was the climax of moments that had preceded it. I'll prove it to you in the text. In our version we read, when Paul hears the voice from heaven who is God saying, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is hard for you to kick against my will. Another version, which I've read for years but didn't know what it talked about, it says, Paul, Paul, it is hard for you to kick against the goads, the goads. What, what was a goad? A farmer, when he was plowing his field, had cattle. And a goad was a stick. And the farmer, whenever the cattle was getting out of line, filling himself, and said, I'm going to do my own thing, the farmer would take the goad and just, mm, mm, and just poke the cattle to get the cattle on the right path. He would just mm, poke the cattle, just to let them know, don't forget who your daddy is. Just poke it. Come on, can we be real? Has God ever just been 
uh, all while you and the more the cattle resisted the more the gold hurt the more he fought back the more it hurt God said with Paul I have been poking you a long time and you've been fighting against me some of you God's been trying to get your attention for a long time and the more you fight it the more it hurts God had already been working on Paul before the Damascus road the Damascus road was the delivery room so that means, watch this, while Paul was killing Christians, God was turning him into one. While Paul was arresting Christians, God was arresting his heart. While he was locking them up, he was listening to the praise songs they were singing in the cell. Don't you ever judge what God is doing in somebody's life by the external. You have no idea when conversion has taken place. And woe unto the church if we judge people by external appearances. When the person who wrote two-thirds of the New Testament, God was working on them while he was killing Christians. You don't know what God is doing in somebody's life while he's killing them. God speaking and I think it was in the way that they died I think Paul is watching them die even Stephen and he's watching the smile on their face as they're being stoned he's watching them sing songs as they're being beaten and whipped and he goes this this can't be fake you don't fake this in death this has got to be real God was speaking to his heart it's what made a centurion on a cross one day who had seen several crucifixions. But all of a sudden, one day when Jesus was crucified, there was something different about the way he died. And he said, surely this man was the son of God. This is the power of conversion. Spoiler alert, you're about to see the power of conversion right now. You're going to see some man with signs. And on one side, you'll see the consequences of sin. On the other side, you'll see the reality of a savior. On the front part of the cardboard, <clears throat> it'll be pretty short because we don't have that much cardboard. It'll also be edited. The sin on the front, it'll be edited because you can't handle the truth. Oh, come on. If they show their real testimony, what they really went through, some of you can handle the truth. But yet they're about to display for us the power of conversion. When the cover is gone, then God can change you. Watch this. I declare over the men of the church that they would walk in faithfulness. Lord, for we know that you honor faithfulness. So I declare that the men of Trinity Church will be faithful husbands, faithful fathers, faithful givers, faithful in serving their church, and faithful to their God. People come together, strangers, neighbors, our blood is one Children of generations Of every nation The kingdom come Don't let your heart be troubled Hold your head up high Don't fear no evil Fix your eyes on this one truth. God is madly in love with you. So take courage, hold on, be strong. Remember where help comes from. I pray over the man of Trinity Church today. And I bless you with an intimate and intense relationship with the Holy Spirit. You, by His grace, 
I enter into your true identity as a priest of the God, a, a spiritual leader in your home, and a Holy Ghost influence in your city. Trinity Church to have the confidence to be the fathers that God has called you to be, to cherish every moment that you have with your families, that you, you understand you don't have to be perfect, you just have to be present, and that you would grow in Christ every day for your family to see. Everything with every piece of the children, clean hands, pure heart, good grace, good God. His name is Jesus. Swing wide, are you heavens? Let the praise go up as the walls come down. All creation, everything with breath repeats the sound. All the children, clean hands, pure hearts, good grace, good God. His name is Jesus. Why are you there? Let the praise go up as the walls come down. All creation, everything with breath repeats the sound. All these children, clean hands, pure heart, good grace, good God. His name is Jesus. As a father, may your children be blessed abundantly, and may your God be your strength and your shield. Give God 
and the power of his transformation. Some praise in this place today. Come on, you could do better than that. How does, how does somebody who used to persecute Christians kill them? end up writing two-thirds of the New Testament? How does an atheist go from being a blood-bought believer? It's the power of conversion. When you remove the cover and not settle for your truth but the truth, you will be changed. Conversion, watch this, it's not just in a moment. This is the edited Wikipedia version. Come on, if we gave them the mic, they could tell you some stories. Conversion, it's a mystery, but it's also undeniable. There is a moment where everything shifts and changes, and every moment leading up to it is just as significant. After Paul removed the cover, after he had the conversion, God didn't just save you for you to come to church and sing songs off a screen like it's Christian karaoke and sit on your blessed assurance, but he got the call call. He said, I want you to go watch this to the Gentiles and tell them, declare that they've got to switch from the power of Satan to the power of God. Watch this. Paul is a Jew. He gets converted. Jews were the insiders. He gets converted, becomes an outsider. God doesn't send him back to the insiders. He sent him to the Gentiles, the outsiders, to tell the outsiders, y'all can be insiders. And then when he went to the Jews, who were the insiders? He said, you're an insider, but you still got to repent of your sins. Otherwise, you're an outsider, even though you're an insider. So he's telling the insiders, you're not just an insider, you're an outsider because you need Jesus. He's telling the outsiders, you're not an outsider. It doesn't disqualify you. You can be an insider. It's confusing. That's what the call is. God's call is confusing. God's call, watch this, is uncomfortable. Paul was whipped and beating beaten. But just because your call is uncomfortable and confusing doesn't mean it's not critical. Because where would we be without Paul? Paul tells us, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Paul tells us, all things work for the good of them that love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. Paul says we shall not all sleep, but in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, we will be caught up to heaven. All that is Paul's lyrics. Imagine if he would have given up on his call just because it was uncomfortable and it wasn't clear. Some of us think because our call is uncomfortable, it's not clear, that it's not your call. Your call is still critical. And if you don't do anything but stand and declare what God has done in your life to somebody around you, you've accomplished it. I'm going to ask every head be bowed, all eyes be closed. I believe this is a Damascus moment for somebody. Hear me, I've learned, I know I just turned 35, it's not super old, but it's enough to know that I don't always judge the reaction of a message by what's happening externally. You could be sleeping, be rolling your eyes, sucking your teeth, but the reality is sometimes conversion is happening on the inside when you don't even realize it. And all of a sudden there's that moment you say, I'm tired of fighting. This is hurting me <laughs> to keep fighting against the goads. And I just want to give on this Father's Day somebody a moment to say today, the mask is coming off. The cover is being removed. I got to be converted. I got to be changed. So with heads bowed, eyes closed, nobody's moving. Nobody's leaving. You're here today and you'd be so honest to say, today's the day, today's the day. I need to surrender my life to Jesus. I am tired of fighting. I am tired of running. I am tired of being stubborn about my truth. Today, the cover's coming off. I'm coming to the truth. You can't handle the truth, but the truth can handle you. And his name is Jesus. Heads bowed, eyes closed, it'd be so honest to say, that's me today, today. I need to give him my life. I'm coming home today. Would you just lift up your hand? I don't care if it's just one person. Paul was one man that turned the world upside down. I'm telling you, you have no clue what's on the other side of your surrender. Would you lift your hand and say, that's me, to me, today, today, today. I'm giving him my life, giving him my life. Hands are going up. 
in the balcony on the main section. Anybody else just lift it up. You can put it right back down. Thank you, Jesus. Heads are still bowed. Eyes are still closed. Maybe you're here today and you say, you know what? I am a believer. I have converted. However, I'm not stepping in my call. When was the last time you told somebody about this God you believe in and serve? God has a call on your life. You were not at that job on accident. How dare you not declare the goodness of God? God set you up at that job so you would be a light in the darkness. Don't you not open up your mouth for God just because it's uncomfortable. He's calling you to declare what he's done in your life. If that's you and you say that resonates with me, I need to step into the call. If I don't do anything but tell my BC before Christ's story, today's the day I'm stepping into that. Would you just lift up your hand as a sign you know who I'm talking to too. Say that's me today. Just lift it up and put it right back down. Thank you, God. Thank you, Jesus. If you lifted up your hand for any one of those, this is not to embarrass you. I believe a Damascus moment is about to happen at this altar. If you lifted up your hand, or you should have, when I count to three, I just want you to get out of your seat and come to this altar. And as you do, you're going to be surrounded by a crowd of witnesses who are going to just start giving God praise as soon as a person gets to this altar. When I count to three, I want you to come without fear of what somebody's going to think about you. One, this is your moment. Two, this is your day to remove the cover. Three, would you come? from the balcony, from the sides, wherever you are. I want you to come all the way up to the front. Come on. This is your day. This is your day. This is your moment. Come on. Come on. Wherever you are, this is your moment. Come on, church. Would you give God some praise like the angels are in heaven? Come on. Come on. Come on. Today's the day. I'm today. I'm going to be changed from the inside out. Come on, don't stop giving God praise until they stop coming. Something is happening on the inside. Come on, I dare you to create an atmosphere for somebody to say, I'm tired of fighting. Today's the day. I'm coming out with my hands up. Come on. Thank you, Jesus. Anybody else? Anybody else? Today's the day. I surrender. I want to wait just a few more moments because I know the enemy loves to come in your mind and say, no, you can't come down there. What are people going to think? Who cares what other people think? This is about you. How long do you want to walk around with that cover? This is about you being changed. Anybody else, I want you to come. I want you to come. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Hallelujah. Come on, can we lift up your hands? If this altar, just lift up your hands. Pretend like you're the only person in here. In fact, let's join them, all of us today, and let's just pray this prayer. Some friends are coming behind you for some personal prayer. But I just want you to say this from your heart. This is your moment. Say, dear Jesus, thank you so much for loving me enough to pay the price for my sin. Jesus today with my hands lifted I surrender your will not my will you are the truth I can't handle the truth but you can handle me so I surrender forgive me of my sin make me brand new from this moment forward I'm following you and I step into my call. I will declare that you have brought me out from darkness into the light. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen. Come on, can we give God praise today? Oh, come on, you can do better than that. Can we give Jesus praise today? Hallelujah.